Color Decoded, The Textiles of Richard Landis Richard Landis is a retired weaver who lives in Prescott, Arizona. His work explores complex systems of related colors. Color and, and form have always, apparently since I could conceive of anything, those were of interest to me. And then I, you know, Crayolas when I was a little bitty kid, I mean, I was always marking up everything. Mm -hmm. And um, and I just, and then later, I mean, in cooking and in selecting fruits and even vegetables, mm -hmm. you look at the coloring to tell, are they good or not? Mm -hmm. And so everything we do with our senses, visually, uh, is interpret color in very meaningful ways that help us eat better and, and uh, so forth. Mm -hmm. The way we were moved around, I got to see some of the lower southern part of Japan by train. And just the mountains, the country, and the way things are organized, I was thrilled. I just thought it was, this was the neatest thing. Because I'd traveled a lot before that. But I really thought that that was just, uh, there was something about the way design was considered and carried out that, that I responded to. I'm sure I never would have gone into weaving if I hadn't fallen in love with the fabric and, and OB design. And, and they would have these kimono links, you know, on display in the window, and they'd have five or six different ones, and they were stunning. I mean, and I was just, I was blown away by it. And that's what really did trigger me to think, God, maybe you may be weaving. Because the other arts never did really, I, I did life drawing, and I even had a show, They and, and some of my work went into offices of the people at ASU. Um, and I was, you know, well received, but it, it just wasn't personal. And the minute, I got to, took these th three days of weaving course with Mary Pendleton in Sedona. I then really started pursuing weaving. And very soon I became really engrossed and, and I sort of realized I was gonna make a stab at it. When I first, when I first decided I was gonna commit to uh, using the loom, uh, I mean, actually, the day that I was at Mary Pendleton's and I started, she was showing me how to dress a loom, how to wind a warp, how to put it onto the loom, and how to start weaving. Um, you don't have a whole year, there's so many technicalities that you have to uh, get in the beginning that you, you, you're completely consumed in just trying to do it, uh, trying to do what you're told, um, trying to get it right, and then after a little while, I started changing some of them. I saw that I wanted to do a, a different thing with it. And then one thing led to another, and, and I was, boy, I was diligent. I remember I had a warp that I was quite excited about on the loom when I went to work for the post office at Christmas, which I did to get just a little bit of money. And, and uh, so we were working 14 to 16 hours at night at Christmas time when it was quite cold. And then I would come home after that and I would put in an hour or two weaving just so that I felt I wasn't losing track, you know. So I, I, was, I was diligent at times. Um, and then when the, when, the, when the weaving really starts to get interesting, um, then it was really fun because while I say you can't see the whole weaving, but you can look at a certain area that you've just woven and before it gets wound on down, you know. The, so you've got this little area you're watching. And if, if, if there's really, if it's working and it's really a beautiful color system and it, you're seeing it come to life because you've only imagined what you hope it will look like, but when you see the actual thing, I mean, I would go all the way around the loom looking at it from like four different directions because the light is hitting it, 
And that's the beautiful thing about weaving. So when I got into the, even the first warp with Mary Pendleton the, up there in the three-day deal, she usually had them start out with a, with a white or off-white warp, and I chose to do a blue warp, and, 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 I, and then I was entering all sorts of other colors in it, and, and that's what fascinated me. So color, I could see that, that I could not only use the color, but I could blend these colors and come up with new ones that I didn't even have. I mean, you know, they would, you cross two different colors and you get a third one. And especially when you, the finer you get, the more that is so. I mean, the more obvious it is. Every, everyone always asks me, um, you know, how do you, how do you, you come up with your ideas, how do you get interested in something? And when I looked at art or when I look at nature, uh, including in my gardening, in fishing and hunting, these things are never direct. They are, they are inspirational. I get very involved in them. And it's the feeling you get from being very involved with something that leads you, just little by little, leads you astray into whatever it is. One of my instructors, my sculptor instructor, uh, was Phillips Sanderson. And he and I went down to Organ Pipe National Monument and took stake and camped out. And I said, aren't there any artists around here that are really interesting? And he says, well, I've heard about a crazy artist in Prescott. And he says, I've always kind of wanted to meet him. And I said, well, let's do it. Let's. And he knew somebody that knew Frederick Sommer, and so he was our Virgil. And we called, and he called Fred, and they arranged one night. And then we picked up Philip Curtis, who is a well-known Arizona artist. And so Philip Sanderson and Phil Curtis and I drove up and got to Prescott in the afternoon. And we met down on Whiskey Row. Our Virgil came by and, and took us out to Fred's. Fred showed us photographs first, and here was the first time I saw, in photography, I saw what I consider to be abstraction. He caught parts of nature that was abstract and, and, and completely composed. And I was blown away by the photographs. And then after that, we saw drawings. I'm on the way home, driving the other two artists home, I said, you know, those drawings were crazy. And I mean crazy. Fred was interested in a full tone scale. So he didn't want a lot of contrast. He wanted a real richness of, of tone scale. Well, that really did appeal to me. And you can take that right on into color. And I did. But I didn't do it from him. I did it from looking at the colors of a peach where it's blushing and then it goes through all these shades. Uh, so to say that I responded to his richness of tone scale is true. And it did help me, I'm sure. I mean, that was, when I saw it in his work, I wanted to get some of that same effect. Um, but as far as photography in the black and white, other than this beautiful tonal range, which is important. And the one thing that I consider in my work is that I was interested in tone and hue. So the tone scale and then the presenting of the color itself. But they're, they're totally interrelated. And that was the thing that in weaving really got to me. When I first started, uh, well, the first warp I ever did was with um, uh, cotton because it's strong and plied, I used a plied yarn. Later I, I got interested in using things like, I went from the, that very early stage, I got into linen yarns and Holma from, from Sweden, I think it is. Um, but the tone scale, the selection of colors was very limited. And so I picked out the best I could in those, and I, some of the things happened where I could saw that these groups would either make a solid block or they could neutralize. And then I, when I started working those things, 
even with a fairly limited uh, tone group, I could, I could work. But then later, I, I was able to get a much nicer selection in wool colors than I was in linen. And, but I didn't, I didn't, it, it, it still, and it was, the wool was uh, a heavier yarn, and I, I wanted to get a finer gradation of blended colors. And Jack Larson um, told me about uh, Annie Albers had used thread. And so I, I went to California, I went to Los Angeles, and I saw the thread market for Coates and Clark and a number of different places that sold these things, half pound spools. It's like three miles of thread. Um, and they were in almost infinite colors. So that's when I found that out, that's how I got into using thread. When I would get, when I would decide what my next project was going to be, what the program was going to look like, not finished, not worked out, I would put out the spools, the half pound spools, and I would make what I called the Greek chorus. So I was looking at all these colors I was going to use. I was lining up my palette. And if you didn't fit in, if you weren't a good part of the chorus, if you didn't operate with the other uh, people in the chorus, you got substituted, something else got brought in. So I, I was working with real experience. I mean, I was seeing it before I ever selected. And, and that was very helpful. The, the little system itself was something of a formula, but then it was how to tease that into looking completely different and expressing itself in a different way. And in my work, if anybody ever finds out what I was doing, they'll see that that was what I was doing. I was taking something that was quite simple. It delivered the variation that I wanted as a possibility for sizes and, and, and uh, continual um, movement from one thing to another. And the neat thing in a piece like this large one is that the last color, the last color in each unit is also the first in the next unit. So the transition happens. I mean, that was all taken care of in the way I worked this thing. And because otherwise you couldn't put something like that together and it would just look really haphazard. But they transition right into each other without a, seamlessly. And then also, one of the things that I really loved was that I decided I would accept the absolute loom control, that it was going to be throwing shuttles. There was not going to be any uh, lifting out here and then starting in again. I, t I took a course in, in uh, tapestry. And I was, you know, I was fascinated with it, but I just saw that's not what I want to do. I want to use the loom. And, and uh, because these things are slow anyway, but on the loom, you've at least got, you know, the setup is there, and, and you can do very complex things if you have patience. And it doesn't take as long as, as you might think. On that big piece, I probably didn't actually weave more than four days on that piece, which is pretty remarkable to get that much variation in four days. And how much planning before that? Well, as I said, it took a month to work out the, the program. <laughs> so yes, there's no, there's no easy way. <laughs> but anyway, the, <clears throat> the, the uh, fact that these things are in stripes where the one color is on the front, then it changes and it goes on the back. The other one pops up and comes on the front. <clears throat> and Larson called them knife edge abstractions. But actually, as far as the, surfa <clears throat> the surface goes, they are, it's plain tappy weave all across. Every other thread is, is threaded. And that was kind of a discipline I put on myself. And I wanted to see what I could do within those confines. I wanted to get something more abstract 
and something that I could make a composition with. And so I started using the striped double weave, which gives you all this alternation possible. And, and then when you put that with a lot of different colors, they, they have written about my work that there were hundreds of different shades. Well, there really aren't. Um, it, because I always kept fairly reasonably limited palettes, not just six tones, but I mean it was, it, it was somewhat confined because that way you get a relationship that things, when you make all the variations, they hold together in the end. They look like they're part of a, a, a work of art. And so anyway, Double Weave just offers you so many different possibilities of positioning. Uh, and that's the main reason that, that I want to double weave. And I could work out very abstract compositions uh, in double weave. I don't think I could have done some of these very complex pieces without having looked into that all the time. And then the little picture down there on the floor of, of the spring, the way the vegetation is all intertwined, and then my whole time, like up in the Sierra Ancha and in the uh, Wind River Range in Wyoming, I was looking at incredibly complex landscapes. And there's a place on the Salt River that we floated through in a little rubber raft that is the most chaotic piece of earth I've ever seen. It's just total upheaval and in the most stunning ways. And uh, being comfortable in big complexities um, allows you to do complex things and to see them. And I really did see what abstraction was. And then when I saw Frederick Summers' photographs, I saw abstraction in photography of nature. And then I realized it was just freewheeling. You could abstract anything. You could just make something that would represent the natural living thing, and it would be the symbol of of um, what you had seen, and and in a way what you experienced. And of course, when I Kandinsky was was uh, one of the people that gave me permission, and the, and I could always see how art related to nature. I mean, you know how it was trying to and trying to represent and in ways that we could understand. And I thought I understood and I liked it. The more you understand in nature, if you're also dealing in abstraction, obviously it gives you a wider range that you can apply to your abstraction from nature. And nature's the big baby. I mean, my inspiration is simply life itself and all my different relations to different aspects and the fact that that there is you know cooking gardening cooking um, uh, eating tasting uh, I mean I'm a, I think that I'm a definitely have always been a real sensualist um, I mean my senses I I trust them and I have always cultivated them and um, that is what gives you the inspiration to do anything. Special thanks to Richard Landis. Produced by Chris J. Gautier, with help from Susan Brown, Cooper Hewitt, Smithsonian Design Museum, for the exhibition Color Decoded, The Textiles of Richard Landis.